hi everyone. Uh, I am first going to ask Ben to, um, oh no wait, I've got access to all the attendees. Uh, I'm first going to put a bit.ly link in the Zoom chat. Uh, this is to what you hopefully can see on your screen at the moment, which is how we're presenting our slides today uh, using something called a Miro board. Um, you may or may not have heard of it. Um, but this is how we'll be doing a lot of our workshop activities and how we'll be delivering the content. And it's also accessible um, throughout the workshop uh, talk and also afterwards as well. So it's a nice way to uh, have all of the content um, throughout, throughout the time that you might need it. We have locked a lot of things. So there's a function to lock a lot of the content. So don't worry too much if you're clicking around um, and you know, th there's no chance that you could accidentally move something or accidentally delete something, or it's very un unlikely. We've also got a backup, so don't worry. Um, but one of the things that you will be able to do um, is you will be able to add text and you will be able to edit some text. So we would ask you, as per usual, to um, abide by the code of conduct that All Things Open has and make sure that you're being respectful and that you're being um, you know, kind and considerate with the language that you use and that you are not doing anything untoward on our Mary board. So let's, uh, let's head in. Also, hey, Abby, it's so good to see you. And also, I, I'm so happy to be doing this workshop with you. Um, this is the open source design contributions for your open source uh, project. Um, I've dropped the link to this Miro board in the chat, um, but as more and more people come in to the Zoom, if I could maybe ask Ben to just kind of every so often just drop the bit.ly link in the chat, just so that everyone's got access to it when they join, because I know that you don't see the Zoom uh, chat history. We'd really like to see um, people on the Miro board when we start doing uh, activities as well. So, oh, page not found, link is not working. Let's figure, let's sort that out first. This is important. Okay, give me two seconds, folks. You know, these are, these are the things about, um, workshops and conferences that are always things that you always things that you um, can never anticipate usually so just a second hmm. give me two seconds folks I'm going to get you the right link It won't take me too long. And also, you know, as we spend a bit of time to wait for other people to come in, it's never time wasted when we make sure that our tech is working correctly. Okie dokie. I was missing a dash, look at that. There we go. Always double check your uh, spelling. <laughs> of links. <laughs> right, okay, cool. Thanks, folks, for bearing with me as I uh, fix that. So back into presentation mode. So, okay, jumping back into it. Hello, I am Errol. Uh, my, if you want to find me online, you can find me on Twitter at Errol Does Design. I use they, them pronouns. So if you're uh, referencing me in any kind of uh, tweet or anything, I would uh, be really grateful if you could uh, use my pronouns, the they, them. I have been doing design for around 10 years now. I actually don't remember exactly how many years, um, but around 10 years in digital product design and user experience. I started out in commercial and for-profit companies before uh, transitioning into the humanitarian sector and the open source sector around about three to four years ago. Um, so I haven't been in open source for very long, but the time that I've spent in open source has been very uh, intense and very um, 
feels like I've crammed 10 years into a few years, which is a good thing, I think. Um, I now work at the an organization called Open Food Network uh, as their designer there. Um, they are an open source uh, platform for uh, small food supply chains and supporting producers globally. So producers like farmers or anybody that makes edible things or things that you would like to buy. That's what the Open Food Network does. And I'm also a PhD um, researcher candidate um, for a computer science uh, program at Newcastle University where I look into and research how designers are involving themselves in open source projects with a for good or a humanitarian human rights purpose. Okay, so handing over to Abby. Hi everyone, um, I am Abby, Abby Gorm Akuru. Um, I'm from Nigeria. And um, you can find me on Twitter at abigo underscore Mac, that is M-E-K. I use the pronouns she or her. And um, yeah, I'm a product designer and open source design advocate. That advocate actually, it's a cool name I got from a peer. And I have about over three years of combined experience in technology. I say combined because I've been doing quite a lot of things from design to software development in um, C Sharp and yeah, just IT consulting. But in product design and user experience, I have two years of experience and counting. And um, I was a Google coding mentor for the Anita Borg community, which is an open source community that encourages, you know, contribution to open source from people with any skill level or background. And it was really interesting because that was the very first point of entry I had into open source. And it was just so welcoming. I found it welcoming, not a lot of people do, but it was really encouraging that I was able to break in like that. And since then I have been actively advocating for you know, more designers and open source, more design contributions and educating people on how they can go about, educating designers um, specifically on how they can go about making their open source contributions. I'm currently a product design consultant at AFTE. Um, a really cool food centered initiative and yeah that, that's it for me. Cool. Uh, so we we're really thrilled to actually one be uh, helping you continue your open source and design journey or start your open source and design journey and I am also really really thrilled to be doing this with Abby. Uh, I saw Abby speak at Open Source Community Africa this year and I was uh, so eager to do something with them uh, with her um, that I was so glad that all things open came along and I was like Abby we need to we need to work together on this so we are thrilled to be here especially together. Um, so just to kind of do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so the tools that we'll be using for this session are mostly, was, we're, go, we're gonna be two tools. Um, it's gonna be the regular Zoom. Uh, we were hoping to use Zoom breakouts, but because we haven't got access to Zoom breakout rooms uh, because of the format of um, All Things Open Zoom, uh, we'll actually be using Jitsi rooms for the breakout activities that we have planned. And we're also using a tool which uh, the link in the chat um, should be uh, available throughout the session for you to, to click on. It should open up in a browser. You don't need a um, login to access it. It should be all open access, um, but it's called Miro and it's what you should be seeing on the screen at the moment. It's where we've got our slides. It's also where we've got various notes and all the different activities that we have planned for the next uh, two and three quarter hours. So you can also find the uh, link on the screen at the moment, although don't use that one. It needs a dash in it. Uh, use the one in the chat. Um, the other thing that we might be using, it depends on how your different groups are investigating the different um, activities that we have planned, but you might want to use GitHub or GitLab to share and investigate different open source projects and the issues um, that we'll be talking about. So you might want to share links to your projects when we start talking about design in the open source projects. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll introduce really quickly how we're going to do the breakout rooms. So um, we're going to be using Jitsi, which is a uh, video um, service which is free and again you don't need anything to um, log into it so you should just be able to use a link 
And what I've done is I've very, very quickly put together a new section on our Miro board, which is actually up in the top, top left-hand corner. And what I can do um, is one of the magic things that I can do in the uh, Miro is I can bring everyone to me so that everyone that's currently on this link has access to this section. But what I'd really like folks to do is if you intend on actively participating in the group activities where you'll head to Jitsi rooms to discuss uh, design related topics on open source, if you could please spend a bit of time just adding your name into one of the groups and this will um, make sure that you have a room to go to and people to talk about these, um, these activities uh, with. So all you need to do to be able to add your name into a group is just click on the um, sort of fake uh, virtual post-it note that we have here. And if you double click, you should be able to edit the text and you can type in your name here and then um, uh, you'll be assigned to that group number one. The link underneath, it will be your Jitsi room link. When you click on this link, this will open and I'll just show you what the Jitsi room looks like just in case you haven't used Jitsi before. You get um, a screen that asks you to, um, for your kind of microphone or camera access, you don't need to give this to Jitsi, you don't have to, just like with Zoom, you don't have to. You can pop in your name and then you can join the meeting. And essentially you get then access to a video room that only people with this link will be able to enter. Please let us know in the Zoom chat if there are any problems with this. What we're gonna do is we're gonna try and work uh, through this as best we can um, and troubleshoot any problems that we might uh, come across. Um, but you should then be able to unmute yourself and also use a chat function to talk about the different activities with the group, uh, the groups uh, that you join. Um, what else is important about knowing Jitsi? Ah, so the other really important thing is because we're using two different services for um, video, audio, chat, we're using the Zoom to present the content and we're asking you to enter Jitsi rooms to have discussions. Sometimes if you're not using headphones and you're listening to me speak out on uh, your speakers, um, on your, your computer, what can happen is if I'm speaking on the Zoom at the same time you open a Jitsi room and you're not muted in the Jitsi room, you can get that weird echo that happens and it's really oh, not very pleasant to, to hear. It's like a tinny echo. So you can stop that happening by uh, muting your uh, audio just down here on the Jitsi room before you enter. And that way the audio that I'm uh, putting through the Zoom won't go through the Jitsi uh, audio as well. You can let people know when you're in the Jitsi room uh, by using the chat, you can just say, hey, and then at, one, at some point I will mute myself and we will mute ourselves in the Zoom room so that you can have your conversations in the Jitsi room for the allotted time of the activity. So we'll, we'll, we'll work our way through it. We'll, we'll experiment and we'll see how it goes. Um, again, do let us know uh, if there's any problems. So also I can see some folks putting down their, their names. Um, if you wanna find the um, section where you can write down your name on the mirror board, you can uh, toggle or untoggle this little map at the bottom right hand corner, which gives you the whole view of where things are. And you can move around this little square to find where you need to be. So if you wanted to come back to our slides, you can see them all here and the activities, and then you can always move back here. To take the map away again, you click on the little map icon and it minimizes so that you can uh, have an uncluttered view of uh, the mirror board. So um, just to kind of go back to some more housekeeping um, for today's agenda, um, the first thing that I'm going to say just before we go through today's agenda is for the new folks that might have joined um, is we have uh, somebody else that's helping us out. His name is James Reichel. You'll see hear him um, on the panelists. He is here to help anybody that might be struggling with Miro. So if you're finding it hard to type down text or if you're finding it hard in your Jitsi rooms um, to work on the activity that we've presented. James is also here as well as me and Abby to help you work through these activities. So with um, 
most of the housekeeping done and the unknown housekeeping with the Jitsi rooms. There's always a surprise with the workshops and talks. Um, just a little bit about the agenda. So uh, we're going to do a really short introduction to open source design from a very limited perspective, just two different perspectives from myself and, and Abby. We're going to talk a little bit about why you should care about design. Then we've got an activity, which is a group activity. So that will be in your Jitsi rooms where you talk about welcoming designers to your open source software. Um, and we'll go through the activity when we get to it. So don't worry about that. We then have um, a section about open source design documentation, which is a solo activity where we go through the questions. You have a think to yourself, you might want to use pen and paper. You might want to use your own notepad docs. However you want to respond to this solo activity is up to you, but it's so that you can take that little break from conversation and think about documentation. So we'll present some information. You can have a think. Um, and then we've got our, uh, last section and last activity which is about good first design issues and the group activity we won't spoil it too much unless you start sort of traveling around on the mirror board and you you get spoilers um but we'll be doing that again in the uh breakout rooms so groups of around five different people will get you in a room together and you'll be able to work on this uh, good first design issue uh, yourself we um We'll try and make time for a Q&A afterwards. Uh, we've planned in time for a Q&A, but hopefully we, we should still get time for that. And also just be aware at this point, if, especially if you've um, recently joined, that the two group activities are really best done in conversation with others. You don't have to use your microphone. You don't have to use your video, but what you can use the chat function and type out in the, in the Jitsi rooms when you're in your breakout rooms. But it is best done in active participation with each other. So we really do encourage you to be here and present and ready to have conversations about the material that you're going to listen to. Um, that being said, we know that there's probably a lot of people that are wanting to stick around here and just listen in and not be active participants. You are absolutely also welcome to sit in. There just might be sections where there's about 20 minutes or so of silence in the main Zoom room while other people are out in their Jitsi room breakouts having hopefully what we're hoping is going to be pretty awesome conversations about open source design um, and that just might get a bit um, boring for you so at that point you might just want to take a break you might want to um, join a Jitsi room and listen in and just say hey folks I'm listening in um, but we really do again encourage your active participation this kind of work is best done as a group groups activity at that point I'm just going to remove my cat from the room since he's making a lot of noise. <laughs> Again, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so that's what we have planned. Um, Abby, is there anything that I might have missed that you can <laughs> remember? I think everything pretty well. Um, just looking forward okay, to cool. engaging with everyone. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I love, I actually kind of love it when things like that happen in these remote like conferences and these remote like workshops. It's like, of course, like people's cats will be making noises and people's dogs and kids and all these kinds of things. So it's the wonders of uh, real life, right? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so to jump into the intros and some of the um, uh, background information on open source design that we want to um, offer to you today. Uh, this information, it's based off of our experiences as designers who have worked for FOSS organizations or contributed to FOSS um, as volunteer con contributors, or it also could be information given on good faith from other designers from the open source community that we've integrated into the content that we've got here. Our knowledge of some of the deeper history um, of how design uh, connects to open source or FOSS um, is maybe not what we're kind of here to do. We're here to give you some of our experiences and kind of work, take you through some of um, the things that we think work best with open source design um, needs. Um, 
but that is basically what I'm trying to say is that there, there is a whole heap of history um, which is likely rooted in some of the early days of open source um, that we may be missing out. So please, um, please uh, forgive us if we have missed out a vital detail about you know usability really early on in, in open source uh, history. Um, we are mostly speaking from our own experience and, and the things that we've tried and tested. Um, so yeah. So I'm going to do a really quick introduction. Second cat needed letting out. Um, so I'm going to do a really quick introduction to uh, open source design.net. So um, Typically, once a designer is curious, and this is definitely me, this was my experience when I started to work in the open source space, I, I started to get really curious about how to be, um, be more engaged as a designer within the open source space. And one of the first things that I stumbled across was open source design.net. And open source design.net is a community of designers in open source or that are interested in open source. Kind of basically the intersection of design and open source is where um, is in this space of open source design.net is where we typically meet. And it was originally started by a few designers that have been uh, involved in open source work for a number of years, started a Twitter thread wanting to meet other designers that also work on open source or are interested in open source. And that led to the creation of open source design.net. So I'm not going to go into the deeper history of um, the reasons about why open source design.net was uh, founded and created. But what I really want to do is give an overview of some of the things that open source design.net, uh, the community that exists there does. So one of the things that open source design.net has is a job board. And I say job in inverted commas because it's um, a board where any open source uh, community, any open source project, any open source tool can post a, a thing that they need from designers or maybe a, 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 a project that they want to engage a designer on on this job board, either that, that could be paid if it's got some budget attached to it, or it can be uh, gratis. So it can be something that you're looking for open source design contributions for. So the open source design.net uh, community maintain this and uh, run this jobs board as it were. And the reason that we have a jobs board as opposed to uh, maybe a list of issues is because like myself as a designer first coming into the open source space, I really didn't quite know how to find issues that I could work on beyond the open source that I was um, working on and, and initially um, hired to, to, to be doing uh, work on. So I found this job board and this job board serves a purpose to introduce designers that are not familiar with the kinds of processes, the kind of inherent a community that open source has on the existing platforms that it has. So the job board serves a really important purpose in, in that respect. It's a familiar and uh, typical sort of UI for people, designers to, to engage with uh, open source tasks. Open source design, they write articles or they repost articles about design in open source. We have a monthly community call and a support forum where we talk about all manner of different things and, and from talks that we might have planned to um, workshops that we want to offer to other designers to generally like complicated topics about version control in design and things like that. So you'll find lots of different discussion there. We um, tend to have a presence at various different conferences. One of them typically is FOSTEM. So we um, usually have a dev room at FOSTEM where we um, take in the conference talks from different designers or different people that want to give a design related talk. And we also do something called UX clinics. So we go to different conferences and we do something called a, a 15 minute user experience clinic where open source projects can come and talk about a problem that they've got and get 15 minutes with a UX designer. There is um, various other design community outreach and conferences, including um, the design perspective. So this one, uh, so we do it from the open source perspective, but we also do it from the design perspective. And this is a really critical part of, of what we do uh, that's very new actually. So going out into those design conferences, so 
the conferences that are specifically for types of designers that where they will likely have never heard about open source software or if they have it definitely doesn't have a, a prominent uh, prominent um, uh, existence in those kinds of conferences and we go there and do advocacy work for open source at those design design related spaces and we also do partnerships on different projects it's an open community so anyone can join um, there's no criteria to join and there's there's no specific hierarchy the open source design.net community is very very uh, open to everyone of all different skill levels both design and open source to take you through kind of a little bit what the jobs board looks like, just because it might be the thing that you're most curious about. It looks a little bit like this when designers land on it. So there's the different information um, that people can uh, open source projects or uh, open source uh, maintainers or contributors can pop up there. And there's just general information about what is being asked for, whether it's going to be paid and where they can find out more information. And the other side of it is uh, the form that open source maintainers fill in to uh, submit the job. So there's a few different criteria that we have when you want to submit a job. The main thing is that you need to be able to prove uh, that your project that you're submitting is an open source project, because one of the things that we do not want to encourage is designers working on non open source related projects through the open source jobs board. And then uh, there is in the community forum, um, this is just an example of a most recent one, which is a logo for a podcast, uh, open source podcast that's um, coming up. A uh, number of different designers have some ideas on logos for that podcast. And this is kind of the, the way that we do uh, some of the issue tracking and collaboration that is a little bit harder for designers to do because we don't necessarily have tools that do things like pull requests and um, we can't uh, branch uh, other people's design files particularly well or effectively or um, cost effectively as well. So this is how we've managed to do it through the forum threads. So that was a really quick overview of opensourcedesign.net as far as introduction. Abby, over to you on Google Summer of Code and Outreach. Okay, yeah. So besides open source design.net, it's also really interesting to find out that, you know, for designers looking to make design contributions to open source projects and for open source projects looking for design contributions, these open source programs and internships are really a good um, means to, you know, communicate with each other and interact. So um, Outreach and Google Summer of Code it's, it's really interesting to see that they're encouraging more and more design contributions to force um, these days. So, um, so we'll start with Google Summer of Code. Um, it's a global open source program that is try, trying to encourage, you know, more university students to contribute to open source software. And um, so here you would see students making proposals about the kind of contributions they want to make. And I took some time to actually go through some of those um, proposals in the archives. And I noticed that, you know, there were quite a lot of design contributions, um, design proposals that were eventually approved by these organizations like the GNOME project, um, Zulip, and so many other interesting projects. And it was nice to see, you know, the final output of these design contributions. And it's just great when designers can work with other members of the you know, open, source, open source team to improve the usability. Usually the, these projects usually ask for improved usability or user experience or user interface. And it's just nice to see that that can actually be done on these open source programs. And then outreaching is, is quite similar to the Google Summer of Code, but it's a three month paid internship program and it's trying to support diversity in um, free and open source software development. So uh, this is a program that is really interesting to me because I participated in it as an applicant um, earlier this year. And I noticed that there were so many organizations looking and calling for design contributions like the GNOME Foundation, Mozilla, which I got to work with personally. There was Fedora, the OPL Foundation, the Humanitarian OSM team and Intermine, their projects were, were just so interesting to see. Um, and it just showed a lot of detail, like they actually knew what they were asking for, like 
you know, requesting for usability tests and user research studies. Um, these are just a few screenshots from some of the projects that I, I, I looked at. Um, they were asking for design improvements or redesigns, UX reviews, and it was really impressive. Um, back when I, when I contributed and participated in the Outreach program, um, there were so many designers, so, so many designers looking to help make uh, Mozilla Firefox better. And it's just, it's just uh, proof that these open source projects are really effective in bringing together designers. And if you're an open source project looking to get more design contribution, then you should definitely check out either of these programs. Yeah, one of the one of the things that I really enjoyed seeing this year, I actually uh, unofficially mentored somebody the a designer that really, really wanted to apply for one of these. Um, and it, it just it made my uh, heart so happy to see um, organizations that I love and have been following for a number of years uh, as a, you know, open source, um, you know, uh, lover in a sense, uh, to see them wanting skills that I would have wanted to offer them earlier in my career was just, it was just amazing. And I, I can't wait to see more and more of these come through on these kinds of programs and future programs as well that, that don't exist yet that might um, think about how they can specifically include designers within the open source um, technology process from, from right from the beginning, right all the way through um, and retain them as well. So yeah, super cool. Um, okay, so the next section, and again, you're going to be listening to us talk a little bit, um, so a little bit more before we head on to our um, our first activity. Um, so we often hear when we talk about design in open source, um, you know, from from people that have yet to be convinced about the importance of design in general or design specifically in open source, or even sometimes. Um, you know, oh, well, my open source doesn't really have a design aspect to it. And, um, you know, a lot of what we do is kind of have conversations with people and try and think, well, you know, uh, there are lots of different things that designers can offer an open source project. And uh, the limitations that we that we sometimes put on design as a visual medium uh, is is super restrictive. And there are so many other things that, that uh, designers can offer. And we just wanted to talk a little bit, if you're not convinced yet, or if you need to convince other people at your open source organizations, uh, we wanted to talk a bit about why you should care about, uh, why open source uh, software should care about design. So um, we hopefully think that the people that are here are, are ready to be convinced or already convinced, but yes, let's um, let's dive into some of the deeper reasons about why uh, design and designers are a topic to give care and attention to. So I'm going to talk about the Open Design Project briefly, which was a project that was funded at Ushahidi when I worked there as their designer. And then Abby, Abigail is going to talk about um, the Mozilla design contributions uh, straight afterwards. So um, one of the first uh, things to talk about, about why you should care about designers and design in open source was um, what I was talking briefly about earlier. So before um, I was fully embedded in the open source community like I am now, um, um, and kind of doing a lot of the things that most developers would do uh, now, like seeking out different open source projects and creating issues and doing kind of uh, all the sort of stuff that it comes um, reasonably naturally to people that um, are embedded on the coding side of things. I would talk with my colleagues at the open source organizations uh, organization that I worked with, which was Ushahidi, including another designer that I worked with. And um, I, we talked about how I would watch these open source contributions coming in from developers uh, on our tools. And I would wonder and kind of be a bit jealous and a bit sad about not having that for the design side of things as well. And I was like, oh, how can I start to build this kind of energy and excitement for the design side of this open source tool as much as it is for the code side of this open source tool? 
So we actually started off, or I started off um, alongside my uh, design colleague, uh, looking at uh, Mozilla's open design project and then looking into open source design.net and then having uh, some discussions uh, internally and maybe some discussions in externally with the other community members of the open source design group and reading academic papers. But um, what I didn't see was busy and active open source software organizations doing design and sharing what they learned and how. And this was how the open design project really started um, to get kicked off. So uh, with the team at Ushahidi, we started to work on something that tried to be, tried to embody this, the busyness, the activeness and actively sharing what we were learning and how we were, how we were doing it. So open design, I just kind of really briefly want to talk about it. I'm not going to go into depth about exactly what we did because that's a, a whole other kind of topic. But um, the main background is that we piloted in 2018 and 2019 two design jams um, in Berlin and Seattle with two different partners. After having these conversations internally at Ushihidi about what we wanted to try and achieve, we were approached by one, which was Design It, which is a global design agency working across many different countries and the other was Adobe um, and when we started to have the conversations with designer and Adobe about how to engage designers on specifically the um, tools that we are working with at the moment which is Ishihidi's human rights and humanitarian tools we really wanted to uh, understand the challenges that designers had working on open source projects and thankfully designer and Adobe were also really interested in this as well. So these designers within these design jams worked on one of Ushihidi's uh, open source humanitarian tech tools. And the two pilots, the two design jams laid the groundwork for further research, a test methodology and a workshop framework that was then taken to two other design communities in 2019, in late 2019. There was one in Taipei and one in Bangalore. And not to dwell too much on the intricacies of everything that happened and everything that was produced within the open design project because um, we can share a link to the open repo afterwards and you can investigate it uh, more deeply. Um, but what we learned was that there was a huge amount of designers out there that are working commercially, commercially in companies and agencies that actually really want to work on projects that give back to the world and give back to communities. And they really want to use their skills to help solve complex problems for both end user tools, like the ones we were working on at Ushahidi, and also developer tools as well. The difference between a tool that does good for a uh, developer fo focused tool was not too different from something that had uh, kind of very obvious uh, human rights and humanitarian purpose like some of Ushihidi's tools. And um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, talk about today uh, that came through um, literally before this workshop uh, went out uh, or came, went live was I do, um, I, we do versions of this workshop for different kinds of audiences. And one of those audiences is designers. We do a version of this workshop for designers that want to contribute to open source but don't know how. And I had a piece of feedback from uh, a designer about the workshop that I gave in July, um, which was um, just a comment on how uh, how they wanted, so how they so passionately wanted to understand how a project uh, needed them so that they could um, put together a pitch. So what they said was, what would have really helped me to know that this project wants me? Um, was the question that they asked themselves in the workshop. And they thought about focusing on um, a part of uh, the open source process, which was building a case study uh, that they, the designer would then send to a specific project to outline how they could add value, uh, design value, and how to really help the open source projects um, better understand this is what I can provide and this is why I care and this is how I'm going to help you. So that to me shows that there are so many designers out there that are so passionate about wanting to help and wanting to contribute that they are there um, thinking about these proposals, um, these these case study values um, documents that they can send to these open source projects to to ask them like please please let me help. 
So the other thing that I wanted to briefly talk about, I think, um, is more of a general thing. So it's about believing in how design can help improve open source software. So there's a lot of well-documented business cases in technology for how design improves uh, revenue for profit-making companies. And there's a few links on this mirror board if you did want to investigate some of the things that I've read in the past to, to communicate how design Im can improve technology products and, and for-profit products. But I, when I see these and when I've read these and when I've uh, learned from these documents about how design adds value to tech products generally, I don't hear tech products that are for profit um, and don't think about how that could also benefit open source software. So any of these uh, pieces of information, I think, can also be used to build a case for how design can improve what the open source software's goals are as well. So if your open source software's go so software goals are to include a certain type of person within the work that you do, within the um, purpose of the open source software, then design is a function that can help you better understand those people, better um, serve those people. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be through some kind of graphical UI, but it could be just be purely about better understanding the needs of those uh, users and coming up with really solid plans on how to engage with them and how to to provide services or tools or the software indeed uh, and better towards how they would actually use it. So that was um, what I briefly wanted to talk about, uh, just the background from open, the open design project from Ujihidi and just how um, it came through so clearly through that project and then through all other things that I've done with designers around open source about how much they really want to be included and they really care about these kinds of projects. So over to Abby. Oh, you're muted, Abby. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Definitely designers really always, you know, want to make contributions to open source to make it better, to improve it. Um, I personally experienced that uh, when I, again, I'm mentioning the outreach um, program. So I was an applicant for the Mozilla Firefox project. And it's important to note that I was not the selected outreach intern. I was an applicant. And there was a period where we were encouraged to make contributions in the form of conducting a UX review of the Mozilla Firefox preview app that was the mobile application for Android. And I had to review that application for usability issues, for bugs, some of the biggest issues, um, bring them to their attention and explain how I would go about solving those issues as a designer and how I would measure the effectiveness of my design. And I love how practical that was because they could see the direct um, effects of, you know, designers contributing to open source. So this is just an example of one of the issues I raised. I raised um, a couple of them. Um, and I was happy to see that the team actually took these issues seriously and they started trying to address them. So one of them was um, on the app, there was a call to action for the login onboarding card. And I felt that it wasn't explanatory enough, like someone downloading the application might not know exactly what that, um, that term or whatever they used there meant. And I brought it to their attention. I, I made a few suggestions to improve that and yeah it was it was great to see you know everyone working together to solve that issue they had content they had you know engineering and that was that was exciting to see i've mentioned some of the issues in um, the slides you can take a look at them and um, by the side you can also see the full review of um, the app so i just love that um, that gave me the opportunity to make some positive impact to something that people were already using and that just goes to show that designers definitely want to make these contributions. They're really just looking for a way to do that. And yeah, I'm grateful for that opportunity as well. And it's something that I would be excited to see more of going forward. Cool. So it is uh, 15 minutes to uh, the top of the hour. Uh, we the next thing that we have planned uh, in this uh, is no more uh, talking 
just uh, from from us, we've now got um, uh, a activity um, planned for everyone. Well, I, um, my volunteer is telling me that um, since uh, more people have joined, uh, there are not as many people that have written down their names in the, um, the group section of the mirror board. So we're gonna take a little detour um, and take a little like five minute section of this to make sure that people that want to be in a group to do this activity, get the opportunity to write down their names in a group. So uh, what I'm gonna do is head over to the section on the Mary board and show you all where you can put down your name for the group activity. So um, I'm going to uh, make sure that everyone has access to the link. So if you can, everyone that is currently in attendance, you should see in the Zoom chat, there is a bit.ly link to this uh, presentation board. And this is where we're going to be doing the activities, the group activities and the solo activities. And don't worry too much if you're moving things around, really, really don't, don't stress out. This is what Miro is, is supposed to be for. It's supposed to be for active collaboration, which is um, one of the best things um, it does. So what we'd like you to do is if you want to participate, and we really do encourage you to be active participation, uh, active participants in this section, um, is pop your name in one of the groups. And there's five people, um, we can have five people in a group at once. So if you just wanna take some time to make sure that you're on the board and make sure that you wanna be in this group. And if you double click on the, um, on the uh, post-it note, the virtual post-it note, you should be able to highlight and add a name. If for some reason uh, that's not working, then excellent. I can see some people typing and changing. Cool. Um, but if that, if for some reason you're struggling to do that, you can always um, add text over to the side here. There's a there's a way that you can add text uh, to the Miri board uh, using the left-hand uh, section, which is text. Um, or you can even add, uh, add in a new um, post-it note and uh, type in your name on one of those and just kind of resize it and then you can move it over to, to the group. But I'm going to take five minutes for everyone to get on that link that is on the chat and to write your names down in the groups. So we're going to take a really quick five minutes um, and I'm going to mute myself while this happens. Uh, let us know if you're having trouble in the chat, in the Zoom chat. If we if we don't get anyone going going in groups, which is I have to admit not something that we anticipated. Um, then what we will do, oh, okay, we're getting, oh, nice, thanks. It just, yeah, I mean, I should have just waited for the five minutes. Okay, I'm gonna be quiet and let everyone join their groups. Okay, I'll be back in one minute. <laughs> okay, cool. So we've got, we've got two groups so far. If anyone's hesitating to join a group, the activities that we've got planned, they're, they're all about discussion, experimentation. It's not necessarily about getting anything perfectly right. It's about having a go. So really, if you're hesitating, you're like, oh, I'm not really sure. What are you going to ask me to do? Um, are you, <laughs> you going to ask me to do some design work. We're, we're not asking you to do design work, or at least not yet. 
Um, but yeah, we really do encourage you to give it a go. So we need, we need another three people <laughs> in group number two. Ah, excellent. Also, one of the things that I quite like about using a Miro board is that people that maybe haven't used Miro boards yeah, of course, it, of course a developer can join. That's the whole point. Yeah, developers are very welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of the, all of the activities that me and Abby have um, uh, curated for this session is all about, um, you know, introducing uh, open source maintainers, uh, developers, coders, um, into some of the design thinking. So none of the activities require any kind of design expertise at all. So really do not worry. <laughs> Hi, <Jamie>. awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so because we've got because we've got two groups, we're gonna we're gonna go with the two groups that want to do the active participation. Uh, uh, Barna, no, the groups are. If you, I will drop the link. So if you can go here on the link that's in the chat. That will take you to what you see on the screen and it should open up a browser tab uh, for this. Um, it's kind of like an interactive whiteboard is Miro, what we're using here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the magic thing where I bring everyone to me. And what we should see is lots and lots of cursors for lots and lots of people. So if you haven't put down your name in one of the groups yet, pop your name down. To add in your name, all you need to do is a couple of double clicks on the text in the in the card, and then you know you just do the highlight and then just type. So we've got a full group two. So for anyone that wants to still join a group, we would need to we need to fill up group three. Um, I'm going to give it one more minute and um, if nobody else uh, wants to um, do the active participation part of the workshop, then we will go with the two groups and they will have a good time in their Jitsi rooms discussing the activity. So you're totally welcome to just hang out and, and wait for the activity, the people that are um, part of the activity to finish and come back and listen in. There's no obligation to do active participation, but there will be a 15 to 20 minute gap where the two groups or the groups are going to be talking about their activity and uh, working on their activity. Um, so if you want to be part of that, then joining and starting another group is highly recommended. We can uh, we can, if you're having trouble adding your name to one of these cards, we can totally add you into a group yourself. If you wanna just type in the Zoom chat, if you haven't added yourself to a group yet, if you wanna just type in the Zoom chat that you wanna be part of a group, then we can manually um, add you to a group and give you your Jitsi room link.
And again, I'll bring everyone to me just in case folks are So you'll need to come back to your Jitsi rooms uh, for the activity, but first we just need to, we need to take some time and explain what we're gonna be doing. So there's still time to add yourself to a group. We'll come back to this once we've explained the activity, but Abby, let's, let's head into the first activity. Um, cool, okay. So folks, I'm gonna spend some time explaining what we're gonna do. So bear with me as I find where we are. We're here. Okay. So the first activity that we're going to do is a activity called welcoming designers to your open source software. So we're looking at rooms of around five different people to have these discussions. And you can stay in the main room if you just want to um, you know, hang out and wait until other people are done with their activity and listen in to, to uh, what they discover. But um, it will be silent in the main Zoom room while other people are working on their um, breakout discussions. Um, so the aim of this activity is to demonstrate and explore how designers might approach a project, to discuss the motivations and goals needed uh, and needs of designers in uh, open source software, and to think about how your own open source software projects are set up for these needs or set, set for these needs, and to prepare the key processes that encourage and support design contributions. So those are some of the aims that you might want to think about as we go through this activity. So I'm going to move the uh, mirror board again to talk about the activity that we have planned. So here we are. So one of the great things about being able to do activities like this in this way is that you can always come back to this material after the workshop. So you can always, the instructions are here. If you wanted to take take this to your teams and work on it um, in your teams, if you wanted to work on it afterwards, or if you wanted to work on it solo after the workshop or during this workshop, you're absolutely more than welcome to do. Um, but what we've got here is uh, for each of the rooms in which you'll be having your, in the Jitsi rooms where you'll be having your group discussions, we've got um, different templates just below. So these are split out for each group. So we've got one for group one, um, and there's a section where you can double click, click and add your names in there. Um, and then we've got a series of different questions um, for you to answer. Um, please be aware that some people in your rooms might not want to use their video or microphone. So you might um, want to wait for some people to type in the chat when you're in your breakout uh, Jitsi rooms. Um, but what we've got on each group is we've got uh, what we're calling a design designer profile. So group number one is going to look at Vanessa and Vanessa is an early career design designer. Um, she's an open source software novice. She started uh, learning about design about a year ago, takes online design courses and reads some books and articles on user experience design. She gets contracts uh, to design small websites and simple apps from people in her network. And she wants to contribute to something more meaningful and impactful. And she believes open source would be a great place to start. She has some skills in graphic design and user interface design or UI design. And her goals are that she is eager to take on new design challenges to improve skills. So what we've got um, on the side here. So what, what we want you to do is obviously you're going to spend a bit of time introducing yourselves to each other. Um, and then what we want you to do is talk about this designer, talk about this um, person that wants to contribute to the open source projects that you might be part of. Don't worry too much if you're not part of an open source project at the moment, because these questions are fairly universal. They're about welcoming people and better understanding them. So the kinds of questions that we've got here are, have you met someone like this before? Um, what, kinds of, uh, what kinds of conversations have you had with them? And here is where you can double click to uh, edit the text in the mirror board. Um, and we've got questions like, 
how would you welcome this person to your open source software project? And what is maybe the first step that you would take? Um, what do you think would make them feel welcome? And what is one small change that you can make to your open source project that would help this person contribute? Um, if you have a project that you're affiliated with, if you're not affiliated with a project, you can pick the Mozilla project as an example, or you could pick a project that you know about that you're not necessarily affili affiliated with, but you know about. The idea is to just explore the different ways that you can welcome designers into open source software. You've got a little section down here for notes if you're um, wanting to type stuff down which doesn't necessarily fit these questions. Um, but what we really want you to do is have conversations about the, this um, kind of designer that are assigned to each of your groups and uh, think about how to, how to make them feel welcome. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure that everyone's in their Jitsi rooms. Uh, we're gonna mute ourselves on the main Zoom and we're gonna spend the next, um, we're gonna spend the next 15 minutes uh, talking about uh, this, this activity in our groups. So um, the only, the last piece of advice that I would give you is the instructions are all here. So if you get lost and you wanna review the instructions, you can take a look and take a, another read and, and uh, review it. Um, you don't worry about um, moving anything or uh, not on clicking on anything that you shouldn't. Um, I've just made sure that I locked the parts that you, you don't need to edit. You should be able to edit all the different text. And I would say that it's probably a good idea to assign at least one person in your group to uh, a typer or a, uh, somebody that's gonna edit the, the, the questions in the Miro board. So with that, the last thing that I wanna make sure people um, are able to do is in your different groups, you should have a little link to a Jitsi room. Uh, what you'll need to do is click on that link and it will open up a separate video call in a browser. You'll need to join that room and then you can start having a conversation with the people in that group. So what I'm going to do is I am going to mute the Zoom now. Uh, we're going to take 15 minutes on the clock. We'll come back at quarter past uh, the hour and then we're going to do a group. Uh, we're going to do a report back from each of the groups on what they discussed and what they learned about this activity. So if you have any problems, again, you can use the Zoom chat, but me and Abby are gonna head into both of the Jitsi rooms as well to help people out. So see you in your Jitsi breakout rooms. Okay, um, oh gosh, we went a couple of minutes over. Um, I was having a really uh, interesting conversation. Uh, how about you, Abby? How was, you were in group two? Yes, um, I really love like how valuable their contributions are. It shows that they're really thinking about the persona, like, and it's someone that they can, you know, understand and relate to. <laughs> it was great. Oh, cool! Right, so um, because I'm sharing my screen, I'll move away from the group, the groups, and I'll head to the activity. Um, uh, that we've just completed. So for the folks that didn't um, join a breakout room, uh, this is what we were working on in our breakout rooms. We were talking about these individual designer profiles that we've got on the uh, left-hand side here. Uh, we've got one about an er early career designer in open source. And the second group uh, was working on a more experienced specialist kind of persona, which um, I can't wait to, to read um, what, what's going on there. Because um, I found this one personally, you know, a specialist can sometimes be a bit intimidating. Um, so what we're gonna do um, really briefly is um, we're gonna do a short report back on what we learned. So, um, what we would like uh, folks um, to do is either uh, from group number one um, and group number two, if you'd like to, to um, add something into the Zoom chat about what you, what you, what you discussed in your groups and what you, you might have learned um, and something that you might take uh, back to your organizations. So, um, just doing a quick roundup from group number one. I'll maybe do group number one and you can do group number two briefly, Abby. Maybe just like a highlight of what, what was discussed. 
Um, so in group number one, we had the, the very early career um, novice uh, to OSS um, individuals. So super eager, super um, ready to contribute, a little, almost too much kind of energy in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, so ready to contribute that really um, a lot of the things that we identified uh, that would welcome this person best is things like being available and being responsive to, to what they're asking for, listening to them. And one of the things that came out of my, my group that I was sat in that I thought was fantastic was the, some uh, details about asking design specific questions. So um, when we were talking about how would you welcome this person to your open source project, what's the first step that you would take? Uh, one of uh, the people in, in group number one said, ask them what their favorite design tools are, because most people that work with tools uh, for their job function will have some kind of favorite tool or a, a favorite aspect of, of a tool. Um, so in this, what you're signaling is that you are inviting them into participation that is beyond kind of your kind of strict knowledge of say, development sites, uh, the development side of things, the coding side of things or the open source side of things and taking an active interest in what they want to bring to the table by asking them just a simple question like what design tools do you use? It's a really simple way to indicate your interest. Abby. Okay. Um, so for group two, we were looking at Nelly, an experienced UX researcher. So she's a specialist. Um, so when we talked about, you know, if we've met people like this before, um, yeah, some of them had, and they said, you know, they would try to find out what her drivers are, like what makes her interested in contribute, contributing to OSS. Um, and, you know, someone thought that good documentation on the project would really be helpful for someone like this, since she is someone who, you know, relates more to documentation and writing and research. So, you know, having good documentation would definitely help her feel welcome and, you know, it'd be helpful. And then we talked about how they would welcome her to their OSS project. And it was just this empathetic approach, you know, letting her know that her input is valuable, her ideas and suggestions would always be welcome. And trying to connect her to the project's overall vision, because, you know, definitely mm. they know that that's influence um, her design choices. And also making sure that she's connected to, you know, key people on the project because you know that can help them have like some human interaction and really make her feel welcome. And giving her access, you know, to all the project repositories as well, so she can find out, you know, where she wants to contribute to. And you know, talking about what would make her feel welcome, you know, asking her to share some of her past projects. That way, they can kind of assess her and you know know the kind of contributions she can make. Um, that would be great for the team and making sure that the documentation is full of technical jargon that you know she would not be able to understand you know um, and a small change they would make is, to, is to ensure that you know, the projects have good documentation because that is somewhere they believe someone like Nelly would start from when she wants to make a contribution to an open source project so this was this was really great feedback this is fantastic so uh, for all of the people that were skeptical about uh, active participation, this is the kind of um, results that you can get from just a, a really quick um, thought exercise, just asking a few different kinds of questions and, and kind of really taking the time to discuss the, these, um, whilst also having uh, a point of reference, these, these designer profiles, me and Abby um, wrote these um, with, you know, actually quite a, a lot of real life experience um, uh, baked into them. A lot of them are people that we know within the open source community or people that we um, have talked to that want to be part of the open source community. So they are, you know, they're not real people, but they embody a lot of real people. Um, taking the time to really understand them is so, so valuable um, for helping uh, them to, to contribute. Um, one of the things that you picked out, Abby, that I love that your group um, spoke about was involving Nelly, which, who is a more experienced um, researcher, uh, designer, in the vision of the um, open source software project. So that somebody like Nelly, a very experienced 
designer that's worked on very big projects most likely could really help with those product vision from a design perspective uh, things that open source software um, often needs um, help with you know and that she would likely be very very happy to help with those kinds of things um, I just wanted to signal one thing that Jeremy um, has popped in the chat, which I think is great, um, about the early career designer as well that we looked at in group number one. So this um, person was very new to design and the, um, to encourage, uh, be encouraging and understanding that this person, this early career designer that is also really new to open source as well, might not bring solutions to the project in ways that maybe a, a more experienced designer would do. And the, one of the big things that can happen with a lot of eager early career younger designers is that the expectations for them to produce certain kinds of design can be, um, can be just not quite what they're able to offer right now or that they might need more guidance from a, a, a person like Nelly. So you might want to think, one of the great things that you can do with these profiles is you can think about how these different contributors can help each other as well when you invite different kinds of design contributors into your project. That was really fun. I know that it was a little bit uh, difficult to kind of sometimes participation and on Zoom and using Miro can be a bit hard, but I'm so glad that we um, got through it and we got some great stuff down uh, in the board. So um, I'm going to head back to the slides. Uh, we've got, um, going to reorient myself with where we're at and make sure that we've covered everything that we needed to cover for welcoming designers into your open source. Um, one of the things that I'd really like to uh, hear from uh, the attendees is what do you feel like you would need more information about in, in uh, being welcoming for designers? One of the things that's really great for us as um, people constructing workshops around these kinds of uh, needs and issues is um, letting us know either through the Zoom chat or um, later on in the Q&A session about what you think might not uh, we that you might need more resources on um, the questions that you have uh, cropping up when you work through these uh, activities. Um, you might start to think about how you're welcoming designers, but you might start to think, oh, maybe we're not quite there with our documentation yet. How can we actually, you know, uh, work more in a more design way with our documentation? So that's just a, an example off the top of my head. But yeah, have a think about what more information you need. Okay, so uh, our next um, our next section is going to be about design documentation, and we're actually um, right on time to be moving into our next se session uh, section of this. Um, so uh, great that we've been able to recap some of the the technical uh, time. So I'm going to talk um, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, about design documentation and a few different um, aspects of design documentation that I think is useful for folks to know. So um, once you've started to become more involved in open source software as a designer, you're much more forgiving of how we don't typically get added into the onboarding uh, for contributors. So we tend to kind of expect not to be included in readme documentation or a contributor um, uh, documentation. And, you know, a lot of us are quite surprised when we do see design mentioned, you know, it's a nice little, oh, oh, they've actually mentioned design, you know, so, but a lot of designers are pretty much expecting to not have a great deal of information there just yet. And there are a lot of them are um, really um, willing and able to help out with that side of things as well. Um, but we now have a number of different things that we're going to introduce to you from a design documentation point of view that we think that you can do to improve the, the designer contribution experience. Uh, and these are looking at some of the standard um, parts of an open source project. Um, so this is more of a solo activity, so we won't be using the breakout rooms. So everyone should be able to participate in this activity. Um, it's mostly about listening in and responding to the questions in the chat. 
So on to design documentation. So the three uh, sections that we've decided to focus on for this, even though there are lots of different things that you can do with documentation to um, improve it for designers, uh, the first one is on the README. So uh, I like to try and ask uh, open source software organizations and open source software um, projects these kinds of sets of questions. So ask yourself um, right now, um, as this is a, an, another active um, part of the session, have a think as I, as I ask you these questions, what your responses to, to them will be. So you might want to type in the chat or you might want to type in a, in a notes doc or you might want to write down on paper next to you. But um, how can your readme file or your design contribution document, if you don't want to have it within your readme file, how can that documentation welcome designers of all types or specific types that you know you want? So I'll just say that one again. Ask yourself, how can our readme or design contribution doc welcome designers of all types or specific types you know you want? These aren't necessarily trick questions. Um, there are no wrong answers. So whatever kind of pops to your mind might be the perfect way to start this work. So the next question is, ask yourself, how can our readme or design contribution doc invite design general contributions, so general design contributions, or very specific design contributions. The next one is, how can our readme or contribution doc show supporting info that you can give designers? So existing design work and processes. So how can our readme or design contribution doc show supporting info that you can give designers. And don't worry if you're still catching up, a lot of these are still uh, written down in the mirror board, you'll be able to look at them again. You might just wanna write down one word or a couple of kind of quick notes. So another question is, how can our readme or design contribution doc um, what, how can your readme ask what kind of help would you ask for designers? So how can your readme ask for the kind of help that you want to ask from designers? Do you just want design work or processes or training? So the example there gives, gives a little bit of extra information. So when you're writing your readme or your design contribution uh, section of your um, contribution doc, uh, what kinds of help would you ask of designers? Do you want them to produce certain kinds of work? Do you want them to um, offer uh, different kinds of um, contributions? processes or training or supporting other designers. And another one, so uh, how can our readme or design contribution doc help designers get started on your open source project without understanding all of the complexity? So this one I've added in because sometimes it's really hard to know what an open source software project does without, uh, doing an environment on your local machine and, and uh, you know, understanding all the intricacies of what's in development at the moment and maybe what branches people are working on and making sure you, that you have like your local host set up, which is sometimes things that not a lot of designers have a lot of experience in. So how can your readme help designers get started without necessarily having to do that part of the process? And I'm starting to see some stuff come in on chat. You can totally, um, you can write things down yourself or you can pop things in the chat when you think of them. Absolutely encourage folks to do that. And the last one is how can your readme appeal to designers that want to work on projects for good as a focus? 
So one of the things that we learned is that designers really want to work on things that are helping other people. And that could be other developers working on developer tools. So how are you communicating in your readme and your documentations uh, the what your open source project is doing is something that's meaningful for, for the people that use it. To try and really communicate to the, the designers who they're helping by designing this better. So the last thing that I'm gonna do here, and again, you can ask these kinds of questions uh, after this, you can change the questions around. Um, a lot of my dyslexia is showing in some of the wording of these questions because some of the questions do not have uh, certain words in them. So I hope that they do make enough sense. Um, but yeah, you can ask these questions or you can ask slightly different questions. But the main thing is that you're asking questions within your readme, within your contribution docs, within all of your documentation, how can we include designers and how can we make information more accessible to them? So an example that I have um, that you can you can find a link to on the Miro board or if you or if you um, have um, GitHub open is Pali um, and Pali is with um, instead of the two L's it's two ones. There's a link on the um, on the Miro board that you can see, but I like to call Pali an example of minimum viable design docs or MVDD for short. Um, and uh, the example that I've got here on a screenshot is that they have a, um, they have a contribution doc uh, called designers.md. And this contribution um, doc that they have for designers really only includes a few pieces of resources, like some branding, some design guidelines, some resources that they already have that was already created, but mostly has this statement, which I think is a beautiful statement and I'll post I'll post the link to the project in the in the chat in a moment. Um, it has uh, this statement which was um, Pali hasn't had loads of attention in this area i.e design and we'd love you, for you to join us. It's time to bring some thought and consistency to our project designs like as a minimum viable design documentation statement for including designers that is a perfect first statement that you can make to signal to designers that you're ready to start um, having contributions from them. Uh, Abby's just posted the uh, link to the uh, project in the, in the chat. Um, to go through the next couple of se sections um, on uh, documentation, um, we have labels. So, um, Things to think about when you're thinking about different labels within your repository. If you're anything like me, um, working across multiple different kind of open source projects all, all at the same time, each project has a different way of doing labels and, and there maybe are some universal labels and not universal labels. And sometimes the conversations that you have about adding a new label is a really tricky one because we've got too many labels already and really, do we really need to add another label? And the answer uh, tends to be when you're thinking about including designers is that more labels that are more specific really do help. And that if you find that you're not using them, you can always remove them or you can always edit them and change them. So some of the things to think about and ask yourself when thinking about labels are, what kinds of labels do you think you'll need and why? What labels might be missing? And how can we set up a process for design labels we might not know we need yet. And this is one of the most important ones. So how can you think about a process where designers that are coming in to contribute can actually help you develop these sets of labels to then help further designers? So um, remember, it's totally fine to be inviting designers to help you with your labels as a way to engage with them. So how would you, as a designer, want this piece of work, this issue to be labeled? What kind of work do you think is involved in this? Is it user testing? Is it user interface? Is it, is it graphic design? And that kind of interaction can really help you actually include more designers in your project uh, as the first kind of engagement. Um, I recommend a good way of starting is to list your existing labels, both your design ones if you have them or and other labels, and think about the kind of design work that you would like to invite, like if you have an idea on, of what you want. 
Um, and then think about the other labels that you're not so sure about that you could discuss with the community. So if you're not quite sure that you will be asking for things like design research because it seems like such a big thing that you're not ready for, then maybe you can write it down and think about um, having a conversation with the with people that can help you make that decision about whether it's the right design label to have or not. Again, um, one of the things uh, that I just want to make sure that I say is that design is like development in a lot of ways in that there's a lot of jargon. So I've got a couple of linked resources here um, around design words and definitions that are really great um, resources for trying to explain terms that you might not be familiar with and to try and do that jargon busting exercise. There's a couple of examples here from a repository uh, that has a lot of design labels for each kind of different design function here through to one that has slightly less um, and only ones that were, were when they were needed were created right down to um, a repo that is just starting out um, with design contributions that just has a simple label of design an issue for designers and where they're using that as a um, a way of inviting designers into a conversation about the other labels that they might need and what they would want to categorize things as. Um, so I've got people asking for uh, links. Um, you can find a link to this Miro board. Um, so you should, should be able to get access to uh, this Miro board where you'll be able to access all the links on this. Th these won't go away. Um, and uh, you'll be able to click on them and uh, take an exit out to the web page. So once you've got access to this um, board that I'm sharing at the moment, you, you'll have access to all the links. The last one that I'm going to go through really, really quickly is around uh, support, communication and feedback for designers. So one of the things that we often forget about uh, when we're inviting uh, design contributors specifically is um, how uh, are we setting up communication structures and feedback? So some of the things to think about within this are, do you have capacity and interest in the team to guide designers? So how much capacity, if you do have it, do you have to help designers uh, work through what they're working on uh, on your open source? Do you have capacity to have design thinking exercises with them if they want to do some kind of workshop around an issue or a feature build? Do you have capacity to um, review what they're working on? And do you have the interest in trying to learn how to best guide them uh, towards a design solution? Do you need to recruit support for designers um, and then uh, focus on more process? So do you, after asking the first question and you might not have capacity, do you have a need to recruit um, design support? So is the first thing that you wanna start looking for is actually a feedback structure for the designers that are gonna start contributing. So what you're kind of asking yourself there is, do you need a design manager, somebody that's gonna manage the open source uh, design contributions to some extent, especially if you've got a larger project. Um, the next one is what kind of benefits can you plan in for designers and what are, um, what, what differences are there uh, from code-based contributors for uh, the kinds of benefits for designers? Have you, so I added in a couple of examples here around, have you got the ability to offer references for designers when they're applying for jobs? Or do you have the capacity and the, um, the ability to say, yes, designer, once you've worked on this, this uh, open source project, you can add that into your portfolio and you can use it to, to seek work and, and work on other things. Can you do endorsements? What can you do uh, to make the designer um, feel like they're getting something that helps them forward in their career by contributing to your, your open source? Or what kind of other benefits do you think the designer might want? Do they want, um, do they want to be able to see how their contributions are affecting positively the 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 um tool that you're working on if it is a tool how can you best put in place a, a way that the designers can find out how uh how their work is being enjoyed um, or doing feedback so uh the last thing to say on communication um is uh they designers are somewhat a constrained resource at the moment and um 
most of them have, uh, most designers have worked solo as well as in small teams. Um, there are some more that have worked across large teams and depending on what world of design you come from and your experience and expectations and needs are slightly different. So somebody that's um, used to working in small teams might be more, more comfortable with a small open source project and might not need a lot of communication. Um, or a lot of um, guidance. Um, somebody that's works solo really regularly might be really comfortable with say asynchronous um, written communication. Whereas somebody that's used to in-face, um, in-person uh, teams might be more used to more communication, more video calls, more things like that. So how are you setting the expectations for the designers? And that most designers flourish with support and a community around them just like coders do. Um, so the example that I've just got here is around one open source project that I'm part of, and it's the uh, Slack channel that we have uh, access to with a channel that is around designers and all the different work that the designers work on uh, within that project. And um, there are 177 people interested in the design aspect of that open source project. So, you know, there's a lot of different designers with a lot of different expectations and a lot of different communications needs there. So have a think about how you can support the communication needs um, for your designers. So um, I've gone a little over time on the uh, documentation side of things, but what I'd like to do is just spend a couple of minutes on these um, these last questions in the chat. So if you've been furiously writing down answers to these questions or thinking of them uh, with the intention of writing them down now, now's a good chance to, there's gonna be a bit of silence. Um, but there's also a couple of other questions here that you can answer in the chat, should you want to. So have you ever had a designer feedback on your project and how did they do that? This is, this is the pause waiting for people to type in the chat. If I don't get any, that means that, that people have not had design feedback. Uh, Camille, um, you'll be able to find the um, uh, the slide uh, with those links um, if you look for the section at the top which is called open source design documentation so it's quite a big document um, I can um, make sure that you have access to the links afterwards but um, let me grab those dragon links for you now while people are thinking of the answers to whether or not they've had design feedback. Ah, so there's there's actually there's a question for us. So we do have a we have a Q and A section later on, um, and uh, I'm just going to copy paste that and make sure that we cover it later on. So the question was, what types of feedback have you have you received um, that we can take back to our teams that helped us? Uh, or was really negative to our careers. So we'll definitely make sure that we answer that in the in the Q&A section uh, a little later on. Uh, the things, uh, the Q&A section will also be captured on the Miro board as well. And uh, Camille, don't worry too much. We'll, um, when we move on to the next uh, part of the Miro board, we'll, I'll make sure that I bring everyone's cursors to uh, bring everyone's focus to where I am if you're, if you're looking at the Miro board. So the next question is, um, if you want to have a think about this or if you want to write something down in the chat, is there one way that you can think 
Is there one way you think you can improve your, your docs? Um, is it something that we covered in the section above uh, or is it a new idea? So from what we've just said, is there something that you think that you can implement that will improve? I hope so. So I'll wait and see whether anything comes in the chat, but just in the interest of time, I'm going to ask the last question, which is uh, based off of the how to welcome designers, what is your plan uh, or ideas for being welcoming and planning communication? Do you have new information? Do you have ideas to take forward? Okay, so uh, just because of time, we're gonna move on. Um, but that was the um, short section on design documentation. And don't worry if that went a bit too quick for you or if it was a bit much with all the different questions, you're not quite sure um, how exactly you want to start thinking about documentation. All of the content is still here on the mirror board and you can browse it after the workshop. Um, uh, as leisurely as you need to. So um, I'm going to carry on with the next uh, section, which is about good first design issues. And the quick thing that I'm gonna do to make sure that everyone's with me on the board, so I'm gonna bring everyone to me. So uh, if you need to uh, take a break, um, please, please feel free uh, to take a break. Um, I know that this is quite a long session. Um, this is our, our last section and our last group exercise that we'll be doing uh, before the ending Q&A. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, good first design issues now. So um, I hope that most folks are um, familiar with the idea of uh, good first issues or community issues or things that are relatively easy for new contributors to pick up. There is such a thing as good first design issues. Um, and we have um, over the months and years come up with a few different ideas of what we think are really good first design issues that you anybody, regardless of where their open source project is, um, how advanced it is, how new it is, how much uh, design contribution you've had in the past, zero or some or loads. A lot of these good first design issues are really great ones to have in your open source projects almost uh, like permanently. They don't tend to expire and they really only can improve your open source software and the contributions from designers uh, by having them present there. So you might have some ideas on what kind of help you want already from uh, your designers. So you might have a couple of issues in there already about we, we want um, UI help or we want website help or we want graphics help or we want this particular help. And that doesn't mean that you need to remove those. Those are perfectly fine to stay in there, um, but these can help those kinds of issues. So these are also really, really good uh, for those who aren't sure where to start and who are looking for some ideas that have been tested elsewhere to try out. So all of these uh, good first design issues have been tested in different open source projects and they are ones that designers understand and respond well to and also give the open source some kind of value or benefit. But these aren't the only good first design issues. Let them spark your imagination and see what you can ask from the open source community. So I'm going to go over the first few and then I'm going to hand over to Abby. So the first thing that I'm going to do is another jump across the mirror board. Prepare yourself for that. 
So while Miro boards are really great for lots and lots of content uh, for workshops, they do it does get a bit disorientating when you hop around it. So the first thing that I'm going to do is bring everyone to me so that everyone has access to the section that I am looking at at the moment. I'm just going to double check that folks are all here. Yep, we're all here. So the first one that I'm going to talk about um, is a something called a heuristic analysis or what we can call a UX review uh, of your tool, so your open source software. And this is a really great good first design issue to add for user experience designers, looking at finding opportunities to improve your open source uh, by finding usability gaps uh, that are um, difficult to find unless you are evaluating uh, the open source software against a set of clear criteria. And a heuristic analysis can be done uh, like visually on design software. So the designers that are contributing to this could do it in something like Miro, they could do it in something like Photoshop, they could do it in something like uh, GIMP or any kind of software that they, they wanna use, but it can also be done in spreadsheets, uh, slide decks or written down in markdown tables. So however want a designer wants to um, offer the heuristic analysis and UX review, there's loads of different ways that this can be contributed. Uh, so it doesn't have to just purely be in one kind of software or one kind of tool. And there are lots of ways to open source this process as well. There's a really great article from NN Group on how to do heuristic evaluation. In fact, uh, this uh, set of usability heurist heuristics, um, what the, the designers use to guide them uh, guide their heuristic analysis or their UX review um, is available on that um, article link. But essentially, these are the different uh, heuristics that the designers will look at when they're looking at the tool alongside it. So they will think about um, linguistic clarity. So does an interface uh, communicate as efficiently as possible? Um, and they will look at consistency. So if there is an interface, it doesn't always have to be about an interface for those of you that work on tools without interfaces. Is it consistent? So you can change the word interface for anything to do with the, you could change it for the open source software. So is the open source software consistent? And what they can do is use that as a heuristic to measure how they're, how they're looking at the tool. There's a great example article um, just to the side here um, uh, where a designer has gone through a uh, website with, and done a heuristic analysis. You can actually kind of see what this um, could look like. But just for your information, it's not an open source tool that, that they've done this heuristic analysis on. It's a regular tech tool, but it's a really good example. Because I've been talking for a while, I'm going to ask Abby, is there anything that you would like to mention on Good First Issue of UX Review and Heuristic Analysis? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's generally like, you know, conducting a UX review and it might be a lot to take in just looking at all these different heuristics. It's something that designers are more familiar with, but, you know, going through them um, one by one, you would be able to understand practically what each one is about um, and see how you can apply that to your project as well. So it's, it's not rocket science, it's, it's also like something you can understand if you put your mind to it, but it's, this is just to prepare you for the kind of contributions that designers are going to be making to your project. And this is just to show you the value of, you know, this kind of um, task or this kind of contribution and how that could really improve your project. So, yeah, yeah. that's it. And this is what you, you worked on with Mozilla, right, as well, so? Yes, definitely, this is really close to, to that. Yeah. So you can actually edit this as well. It doesn't have to follow these heuristics. You could um, come up with heuristics uh, that you want and uh, are important to your open source as well. So the important thing is that there are templates out there for you to add this as a good first issue and the rewards that you can have as a, as a open source software um, based off of this activity are huge, that you can identify huge gaps that, that can be improved. The next one. Is something that um, some of you might, uh, depending on whether you follow a person called Brad Frost very closely, it might be familiar to you. So Brad Frost um, wrote about some uh, something called an interface inventory a number of different years ago. And I love this as a good first design issue because uh, I don't think that um, 
there's ever a bad time to do an interface inventory. So this is really great for uh, UI designers, interface designers, or visual designers and product designers. So anybody that works with an interface or, or if your tool has an interface as well. So that's one of the criteria for this good first design issue is that your tool has to have some kind of interface. So um, what, this, uh, what this is also really, really good for, I've just uh, mentioned in the um, instructions as well, it's really good if you've ever changed frameworks throughout the, um, throughout the life cycle of your uh, open source uh, software project. So maybe you've changed from a certain framework, you've upgraded to a different framework, and this kind of exercise for designers can really pull out some of those places where the interface um, UI elements do not quite look maybe as consistent as they should be, or maybe um, there are things that a designer would improve that maybe uh, the rest of the team haven't noticed yet. And this is just a really, also a really great um, good first design issue for if you have an interface uh, for your open source tool, that it gets the designer really familiar with your tool as well, because what they need to do is go through each part of the tool and screen grab all the different aspects of it and collect it in this interface inventory document. Um, so uh, I will talk, uh, so I've got another question I'm gonna put into the Q&A section uh, afterwards as well. So there was a question about example of a designer contribution to a project that does not have a UI. So um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we'll make sure that we cover it uh, later on. Uh, it's not impossible. The quick answer is it's not impossible um, uh, to, for a designer to contribute to something that doesn't have a UI, but it does mean that it's a bit more specific, I would say, the kinds of design contribution. So um, this is uh, just on screen at the moment, just to finish the good first design issues, is there is an example of the navigation section of an interface inventory for the good first design issue. This is where um, a tool has been screen grabbed, um, all the different kinds of ways of navigating around this, um, this website or this tool or this, uh, this open source software has been collected in this one place. And when you do this, you can really quickly see um, where things are slightly different or where things can be improved. Uh, those, kinds of, um, those kinds of improvements can be made. Abby, is there anything that you want to say about interface infantry? Yes, I think um, it's something that is really simple to do. Like, it's a great design first issue because you know any designer can um, make this contribution and you know really add value to that project. So it's, it's really good, great. Yeah, it's um, a great one for the early career designers, right? So somebody that might not be as familiar with, say, design software or design processes might be a bit nervous. This is a this is something that. Um, has has very little requirements on like design skills in fact it's actually something really really good for a lot of people to practice actually regardless of whether you're a designer or not but i i every project that i work on open source or otherwise i always do an interface inventory on them uh, the last one that I'm going to talk about is the sticker sheet or design ui system now this one gets a little bit um gets a little bit kind of uh, meta in a way, because uh, why this is a good first design issue is um, because it's really useful for the other designers that will contribute eventually. So um, uh, what a sticker sheet or a design UI system is, is there's a, there's a few different ways that you could name this. And I don't think that there's one single um, way of naming this artifact or this um, design resource, but I. I tend to call it a sticker sheet. Um, it's um, essentially a, a design file of some type can be any kind of um, file that a designer has a preference for. It could be in a proprietary software if they prefer, or it could be in an open source design tool if they do use that. But as long as it's shareable in some capacity, then that is one of the main criteria for a design uh, sticker sheet for your open source uh, software. But essentially what it does is it is a design file of all the UI elements individually and as ecosystems, so collections of UI elements. Um, and it should ideally also include pages of user flows. Um, and as many of those different pages or um, views that you have that are possible to create. So 
why this is really, really useful and really, really important is um, a lot of designers, when they come to contribute on a, a project, will have to cr create these things from scratch if they want to. Um, maybe uh, the designer uh, that wants to contribute doesn't necessarily have the kinds of skills to pull down a UI framework into, into what they're using. Um, you could also have this as a existing UI file. So a lot of um, a lot of design softwares have like, for example, material, Google's material design as an existing um, stock file in some of their software. But what might have happened through the life cycle of your open source, if you are using material design is that you might have changed certain components or you might use components in certain ways that you would not know unless you'd created these kinds of sticker sheets for, for the other designers to work on. And again, like the interface inventory, why this is really important is it gets, one, it gets your, your designers um, really um, familiar with uh, the open source software so that they're creating all these different views of it. Um, and it also builds your design community because they're doing that with the intention of sharing it with other designers. And they're also, uh, the last one that I think is, is that they're enabling design contributions um, from other kinds of levels in the sense that um, if a designer has been able to and has the skills to work with a framework, maybe has some kinds of front end skills or maybe a front end uh, contributor was able to help a designer by pulling down a UI system and, and kind of visualizing it for them in some kind of maybe um, code based pattern library, then if a designer is taking that and translating that into design files, then you're enabling other designers to be able to work on the tool. So you're not having that kind of single point of failure where every time a designer that wants to work on a new um, part of your your tool needs to talk to somebody that can help with the front end side of things or that has an environment set up that can do a screen share that can take screenshots, all those kinds of things. So the more um, the more you encourage the designers to um, create these sticker sheets, these resource files through open source, um, open source good first issues, the better they're going to help the other designers that are coming after them do more work. Um, Abby, anything you want to add here? I think something that's really great with the sticker sheets is um, it enables consistency, you know, with the design. So if like designers are able to contribute to this, then it just ensures that any other designer that's coming to add or make a UI contribution can easily just use the components that the other designers have created. So that way the look and feel of your um, open source project is consistent and you know that's really great for you like the user experience overall. And designers get used to the idea of collaborating within this process as well, right? Because uh, sometimes a lot of, well, all the time when you're new to open source, like every designer is gonna be new to open source with a project. Um, the idea of collaboration on a single sort of tool um, from multiple different designers is quite a new concept for a lot of them. So the more that you're encouraging them to do this kind of process within their good first design issues, the better work they'll do collaboratively handing off issues between designers when they work on this process. So um, we probably haven't covered all the, all the ways that all of these good first design issues will be good, but we have tested a lot of these within communities and we can say that they, they work incredibly well. Um, I'm handing over to Abby for the last good first design issue of Empathy Map and our last activity of the session. Take it away. Okay, so um, Empathy Maps are, you know, really great for user research designers. Um, one of the personas we had, that was Nelly, she, she's the user researcher. And, you know, this, this tool is like really great for her because, you know, it's something that you use to better understand the motivations and you know the drives of the people who use your product or who use your platform. Um, so it's usually something like this, like a board. You can have it on paper, you can have it um, you know with sticky notes or something, but it's usually divided into segments and you're trying to really get into the personality of the person or the user of the product and you want to know what they say you know common things that they say maybe during an interview or your normal interactions with them what are some of the things that they say or they think about things that occupy their thoughts 
it could also be things that they are not um, willingly want, like they would not want to say, you know, voluntarily. You want to find out what the issue could be, you know. So you could also talk about what they hear um, and see common things around them that you think would affect their experience or um, just the way they go through um, the usage of your application. You can also consider what the things that they do you know, on a regular basis, some common things or some random things that you've probably observed them doing. Um, and definitely you can always get insights from those kinds of things because you would know, okay, what are the kinds of things that the people who use your products are used to? And that could definitely um, be used to improve the experience of the application. And then you could also take a look at um, how they feel how they feel, like their emotions, and um, usually like the things that affect them, things that make them, make them feel the way that they do. So this is a sample empathy map for a user of the Resilience app, which is an open source tool for organizing um, voluntary efforts to provide mutual aid. And you can see in the middle, we have like the, a new user, like we're looking at a single persona, a new user. When I say persona, I mean like a user group. So. Um, in design, you can have different kinds of people using your application. So just as I mentioned, this is for mutual aid. There are people offering help and there are people receiving help. So those are like two different kinds of people, two user groups. And this is one of them. Um, so some common things they hear, you know, they hear from family and friends needing help. They hear, you know, if they have the application, it goes off and they hear like alerts. These are things that you can, you know, have on your empathy map. What are some things that they say? Probably things like, um, I need help this month because I lost my second job. Um, I need some quick food to feed the kids. Um, or they asking who can help me? Where can they find help? These might be things that you have heard them say. So this is an example for a particular project. It would definitely be different for, for each different um, open source project. But it's really good to have something like this because it helps you to really put your, yourself in the shoes of the people who are going to be using your platform and you don't need to have any special um, talent it's just about empathizing with these people because when you do you're able to design and develop solutions for them that would appeal to them and that would hopefully solve their problems so that is um, a summary of what the empathy map looks like um, ariel could you go back to the slide so we could continue with that. Okay, great. So empathy mapping really just helps you and your team to um, articulate and just have in a single place everything you already know about the users of your product or your platform. So it's like a single source of truth, something you can always refer to and have shared understanding of um, the users um, of your product and it also it also helps when you make decisions especially you know when it comes to features things you'd like to add or remove things you're considering um, and then you can consider as I said before what the user says what the user does thinks feels hears and sees and additionally some people like to add this also in their empathy maps what the goals of the users are and what their pains are. So their goals are like, you know, things that they want, their motivations, what drives them. And, you know, when you really know what drives these people, then you can design your solution and you can um, develop your, your platform to achieve those, those goals for them. Um, and then it's also important to know their pains, like their frustrations and anxiety. Design is about solving problems and technology is about making life easier. So when you know what pains these people have, um, then you can better um, solve those, those issues with your product. So as mentioned before, the example shows an empathy map for a new user of the resilience app. And our second activity is, is here. Um, we're going to be looking at how we can demonstrate empathy maps, how we can create an empathy map for our open source project. So, um, for this activity, we're going to be going back to our, our Gypsy room and our groups. And each group is going to need to focus on one OSS project. 
um, that at least one person in the group is familiar with. It's okay if um, you don't own an open source project yourself or if you haven't contributed to one yourself, but if there's anyone on the group who has this experience and would like to talk about it, then the group can focus on that project and they can maybe, you know, interview that person, try to find out as much as possible so they can understand basically who the typical user of that project or platform is. And then when you have that understanding of who that person is, then you can really try to imagine or to put yourself in their shoes and think about things that they would normally hear, see, say, think, feel, um, and everything else. So you can, you can ask questions like this. Have you met someone like this before? Um, what kind of comments have you heard them say about the project? What kind of emotions or feelings do you think you know that these that you've sensed from these people when they engage with your product or your 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 project? And then what actions do they regularly take that you have observed? Maybe you've noticed that instead of signing in with their email, they would rather start signing with Google or Facebook. That's just an example. Um, so these are like questions that will really help you to get to think about the user. And we have the sample empathy maps. Um, they're empty on the board. We have an example here that you can always refer to. I have one example in the slides. And this is another one for a new contributor to the Mozilla project. Like, imagine someone who is contributing to Mozilla for the first time. What are some things that they hear and see and say and do and feel and think about? So this is just like something you can refer to while you are building out your own empathy maps for your own selected open source project. So if you look on the, on the board, you would see that we have the empathy maps for different groups, group one, two, three, four, and five. Um, same way we did the last activity, you can click to type your name, and then you can just drag or create a text box and typing whatever you feel is relevant. That is after your conversation with, you know, the people in your group. So Ariel is demonstrating how you can do that. Yes. So um, we still have the same groups. Nothing has changed. Please look for the link to your your Gypsy group. Um, and yes, we'll be heading over. I and Ariel will head over to the different groups to see how you're doing. So we're going to be on mute here and we'll be after this. Yeah, so just a quick reminder for those of you uh, who were assigned to groups before, if you've joined us after groups were assigned, um, you can head into one of these group rooms. Um, we've not got um, as many, att att uh, many attendees um, anymore. So if you want to, um, click on the Jitsi link, uh, which you should be able to uh, get access to. Actually, do you know what I'll do just to just to make things a little bit easier? I'm going to pop both of these Jitsi room links just in our Zoom chat. So um, we've got 18 people still on the call. So if we make sure that we split uh, relatively evenly, if you want to go into a room, if you see that the room is a little bit full, maybe pop into the other one. Um, but you know, if you are named on the group one and you're still around, please go into the group that you were in before and stick there. But maybe there might be some new faces there as well. Um, so for group number one, the Jitsi room is in the Zoom chat. And for group number two, I'm just popping the Jitsi room in the chat now. Um, we're going to mute here on Zoom. So not a lot is going to be happening here on Zoom. Everything's going to be going on in the Jitsi rooms. Uh, we'll come back at um just gone half past uh the hour so we've got about 10 or 15 minutes on the empathy map exercises and me and abby will be in the rooms to help you cool okay so folks should be coming back from their uh group jitsi room so um i'm just gonna make sure that everyone that's still in the mirror board is looking at the same uh, thing that I'm looking at. So we had one group 
working on this activity of an empathy map. And Abby, do you want to do you want to round up this last activity for us and uh, take us uh, to towards the finishing line? Yes, we just have um, a few minutes left, but it was it was really exciting the activity to see you know us building out an empathy map and discovering behaviors of users that we only just imagine. So just just imagine what could happen when you actually deal with real users and and different other projects. So. This is uh, just a report back. You can chat and just say, if you feel an empathy map is a good first design issue, uh, just let us know and tell us why you think it is good or it is not good. And you can also tell us what you find interesting about empathy map. And so you could just leave us a chat, um, but that is it for the empathy mapping. And we'll be going to Q and A right about now. Yeah, so we're really curious about um, the folks that were participating in the empathy map. You know, we we expressed what we were learning there, which was great. Um, for the folks that weren't in the room, take a look at the empathy map on the Miro board. Have a have an explore around the Miro board and have a read of the things that were re being written down, and um, have a think about how an empathy map and the process of an empathy map as a good first design issue, what it can do for you and the, the open source uh, that you're working with. Um, and I think one of the key things that I just wanna wrap up on with, with empathy mapping is that the idea of participating in writing an empathy map in this workshop wasn't to become experts at writing empathy maps ourselves, but to get an idea of what kinds of design contributions through the good first issue of an empathy map will, will give us. So if you now decide after this workshop, I'm gonna create uh, an issue, a good first design issue in our open source repository, which is an empathy map, create for us an empathy map about our users, that you have a, at least an idea of what to expect back from designers when they start to make that contribution. And that was really, the main aim of this exercise was to prepare you for those contributions more than make you experts on empathy mapping. Um, so we've got a few minutes left. We did have a few questions already. So um, let's uh, make sure that those are answered before we finish. Uh, the two questions that were asked a little earlier on in the session were, um, what types of feedback have you received, me and Abby, um, that we can take back to, that, that you as the attendees can take back to your teams that really helped us or was also really negative to our careers? So Abby, have you got anything that you can think of off the top of your head? Um, feedback that you've received as a designer in open source and maybe things that weren't so good? Okay, so um, at first, I, 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 with the Ankleboard community, I actually applied to be a designer, um, you know, to make design contributions, but I was assigned something else uh, that was quality assurance, and it was, it was very, very different. Um, but I did my best, and um, it was a little um, not what I expected, but I continued to make design contributions, and, you know, with Mozilla, it was really friendly and they just kept asking us, trying to challenge, you know, different ways we're thinking. So if, if you know, you assign something else to uh, someone who's looking to contribute and it's not like what they expected, you can try to encourage them to do something that they're more comfortable with. Hmm. Um, negative to my career. Um, nothing. Nothing that, well, I mean, I don't know, uh, I, maybe I've made some terrible enemies in the open source projects that I've worked on. Um, I hope not, but um, there have definitely been challenges in being a designer in open source that aren't necessarily negative to my career. But, um, you know, there are things that I expect now because I've been here for a little while, but I, um, had I had a project that I was working on, the first thing that I needed to do was create a logo, an identity for this open source project that was completely new, never, it was a completely new project. Logos are a really tricky thing because um, 
You want to be as inclusive as possible with everyone and involve everyone in the logo design process. But that often means that you could spend months and years working on logo designs and not actually settle on something. So I now know as a designer to when to call it, um, when to call it basically, this is enough discussion on this um, logo design. I recommend you go with this one, even though these people in the community might not like it for these reasons, this one meets the, the need. I think that that can be really challenging and it can be a negative experience as a designer in open source to um, want to be inclusive and want to give your expertise, but then to um, not be able to, you can't always incorporate everyone's ideas and everyone's um, opinions in, in pieces of design work. And I think that's sometimes one of the things that is really hardest uh, for designers to in open source projects to balance um, because you typically you don't get paid and it's hard work trying to include everyone's voice and also help people understand what kind of um, uh, feedback for something like a piece of design work is really useful and, and um, yeah so not necessarily negative to my career but but yeah, I've definitely been uh, a, a not, you know, not the most, uh, what's the word? I've definitely been very opinionated as well within open source projects. And, you know, uh, I'm sure that some open source projects would pre have preferred a softer approach. So probably not negative, but probably not ideal. Um, the next question was, uh, and we might have a few more coming in the chat. If you've got questions for us, please um, pop them in either the chat or the Q&A function. I'm just going to pop up the Q&A function now because I haven't seen it until now. Um, so uh, can you give an example of a designer contribution to a project that doesn't have a UI? Abby, have you got any examples of this? I, I have like one, but it's, it's a tough question. I'm thinking, um... It could be the stage that the project is at, like, is it never going to have a UI? Um, so if like the person, is, you know, or the team is looking to still have UI contributions, um, then that could something that could be something you could encourage, you know, for someone to build a sticker sheet or some sketches or give some design concepts. Um, but if not, then there could be some user studies. You might just really want to understand more about the users and um do something um an interaction system that works like without a visual interface so i would suggest the user um, study yeah something like that yeah abby raises an amazing point i didn't i didn't even realize like not every project start well no, no projects start with a ui i don't think every project sort of starts with an idea um or at the very least sometimes they move in parallel like sometimes you're building and developing a UI or something alongside the ideas. So the only other example that I have is I had a very long and very interesting conversation about how uh, there was an open source tool or open source project that was uh, interacted, interacted with purely in the terminal window. And, um, you know, a person said to me, there's no design needed in the terminal window. And I said, aha, but there it is. The terminal window is actually a great place for a design because you can do something which is called uh, UX copy design or basically just narrative design. It's basically how you design um, text and how you design uh, phrases and how you, you build the story around something. So you can engage with designers that have a background in um, narrative and copywriting to engage them in projects that are purely text-based. What is this command telling our developers? Uh, what do we actually want to encourage them to do? Do we want to, um, do we want to enhance the experience of using our, our open source through the terminal in a slightly different way? Do we want to even explore that? Um, so yeah, there, even though you might not think, you might think that there are places where design doesn't touch, they're, they're actually, sometimes you can discover really surprising and interesting projects uh, through engaging a, a designer in, in those kinds of conversations. Uh, so there's another uh, question, but we're a little, we've actually gone over time. Um, maybe we'll answer this last one real quick um, and then Ben will kick us out. Uh, 
<laughs> uh, what are the top three things you would tell a development team or any development team to get them thinking about designers and design in their organization and projects? Um, Abby? <laughs> so, um, so I would tell them, you know, designers who want to do good, designers who actually want to contribute, they just might not know how. So just remembering that can help you really go the extra mile to think of how you can welcome your designers or designers who want to contribute to your project. And we already looked at that in an area activity. So that is one thing I would say. Yeah, the top three things. Um, the first one is that the same as Abby's designers they are out there. Not every designer wants to contribute, but there are enough designers out there that want to contribute in so many different ways. And a lot of them are these kinds of groundbreaking, because we're st it's still early in the days of, I think, open source design involvement and contribution. There's not a lot of us active. There's not a lot of us doing the advocacy work, but we're building up our numbers and we're building up our community. So the first thing is that they are there and they really want to help and they just need that pathway in. And sadly, not all of them will know how to build that pathway themselves or have support to build that pathway themselves. So the more that you can do as a development team to build any kind of pathway, any kind of olive branch out to the design community is a, a plus to the general community for open source. Um, try if you have access to designers or conversations with them try and talk to designers about the issues that you face as open source i think a lot of coders or open source maintainers kind of automatically assume that designers aren't really interested in some of the open source topics of interest like licensing or um you know community-based sides of things or even like uh code hygiene and things like that um I have to admit, I'm, I'm less uh, proficient in this sort of code hygiene, PR hygiene, these kinds of things than I am the community and um, um, the other aspects of open source. But I am hugely interested in licensing and I'm hugely interested in how licensing can, can be more inclusive of different kinds of functions. So talk to designers about the kinds of things that you are thinking about in the open source community and try and um, try and practice, I guess, uh, if you're familiar with the term rubber ducking, try and like rubber duck uh, your uh, kinds of topics with, with them. Just, you know, make sure that they can ask questions and clarification and that you can go somewhat back to basics, but also don't assume that it's all about the basics, but some designers have actually come from a code background, so you never know. Um, and the, yeah, the last thing is that not all design is visual and not all design is UI and not all design is logos. And um, I think the best, one of the best things that could be done soon is a better understanding of the variety that design can bring to open source beyond logo design, beyond UI design, beyond design systems. These are all great things and they're fantastic and I love working on them. But the more that we engage with designers of all kinds, uh, the more we'll be more well-rounded in our open source software projects. Um, and hopefully we'll start to build bridges for product people and product managers to start their own uh, venture into open source territory. Um, we're at the end. We thank you for everyone that stuck stuck with us. Thank you for the participants. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your contributions. We hugely appreciate you um, being here with us and going on this journey with us. Please, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, Abby, is there any la anything last words you want to say? I would just say that this was awesome and you know thank you for being here all the way and your contributions have been really really insightful and i'm looking forward to you know all of us encouraging more design contributions in our first project yeah thank you everyone and thank you to all things open as well for having us 
even with a slightly challenging way of delivering this kind of workshop. So yeah, thank you for sticking with us. Yeah.